Melissa Wood. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good okay. afternoon. This is John Moore and Ann Morrison. We're substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle here on the Nutra Medical Report on Friday, the 15th day of June, year of our Lord, 2012. Uh, Dr. Deagle is uh, uh, traveling, and we've uh, agreed to fill in for him. And Ann, uh, both of us were in contact with Dr. Deagle early to, earlier today, and he has a particular subject that he wanted to address, that having to do with radiation from uh, Fukushima reactor number four. And I've got the, your, your notes here in front of me, and, and just what, all, what is all, this all about, Ann? Yeah, well, last week when uh, Dr. Bill was in charge, and of course, you know, we can't substitute for him. We can only, we can only uh, attempt. All right. <laughs> to, well, there's, to, there's only one Dr. Bill. That's true. There's only one Dr. Bill. But anyway, he had announced at that time he was taking a trip, and that's why he's not on the radio today. And he was flying from San Diego to Portland, and he was going to take his Inspector Plus, and he was going to be monitoring the radiation. Uh, during the flight, and I think he even said to the effect that if the radiation got too high <laughs> during the flight, he was going to put an N95 mask, that's a NIOSH 95% ma a mask on his uh, child and his daughter and his wife and himself. And um, so anyway, he, he posted the uh, information during the flight on his website, and um, so he started out, I'll just briefly go over it, as people can go up to uh, newtomedical.com and uh, read it. Uh, so it started out at San Diego International Airport at uh, 22 to 36 counts per minute. At uh, jet stream level, 30,000 feet, it was up at 1,200 counts per minute. Uh -huh. And so essentially he said it rose steadily uh, as he was on his way to Portland. And then when... Uh, <clears throat> When they landed, uh, the the reading at the tarmac in Portland was um, the, in the mid 20s uh, counts per minute. Now his analysis is uh, for the trip was that probably what he was measuring when he was measuring the 1,200 counts per minute at 30,000 feet that it was most probable the Fukushima high altitude radiation fleas. Right. And uh, he also said it's possible there was ionization of the air by ultraviolet. Now, as a non-scientist, to me that says the, air, the oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide itself has been become radioactive. Is that what that means? Well, it's possible. Uh, really? that That's certainly possible. Um, uh, yeah, the UV is that, for instance, the UV in the stratosphere uh, knocks knocks the um, oxygen uh, molecule in half, and then it adds an oxygen molecule to a, uh, an oxygen atom to the oxygen mo molecule to make a um, O3, which is ozone. So right. yes, that's called ionization. And it can happen with deep UV. So if deep UV were penetrating down to 30,000 feet, uh, it's possible that, uh, but, but that I would consider that Probably not what okay. was happening. Well, tell us what a radiation flea is. I mean, it's not like the flea in your dog, obviously. What does that mean? Mm, <laughs> yes. Well, um, the way that uh, Chris from Delaware describes it is that it's a, it's a um, bunch of radioactive molecules that attach themselves to uh, your, your clothing. And uh, he says that when they go out the airlock, they pass over a radiation detector to make sure that they're not carrying out any radioactive particles. And in some cases, uh, the detector will indicate that there's radiation. So, and the way it does that is that the, there's decay of those isotopes, and it sends out either, either an alpha, beta, gamma, or all three. And... Uh, so then they go over them with a uh, wand, and then if they can't find it, if they can't find the source of the of the uh, radiation hit, then they call that a radiation flea. In other words, it's it's something that they know that the person is carrying out on their clothing someplace, but the, either the half life is long enough, or you know the radiation 
radioactive particles do not know what an XY plane is. Right. They, they radiate in all sorts of directions. And uh, so when they're passing the wand over the person, you know, it could be radiating out in a different direction, and they just can't find it. Right. So that's called a radiation flea. And what he's saying is that these airplanes um, cross the ocean, across the pole, and go into Japan. And, of course, the pilots and the, and the flight crew, they go out into uh, Tokyo or wherever they land. Right. And uh, they pick up radiation on their clothing, and then the, when it's time for them to re- return, uh, they carry it into the airplane, and some of those get knocked off, and, and they're embedded in the in the uh, seats and in the walls and in the carpet especially. So, um... Well, were, because, it seems like they would get sucked into the uh, air filtration and air movement system of the aircraft also. Well, I, I thought that they just recirculated the air. Do, are they sucking they do. in there? Well, that's what I mean. It, it, it would get into that air recirculation system. Well, that's right. Yeah, and it could get into the air recirculation system. And unless they're using HEPA filters and and maintaining them, which we know that they are not, um, uh, you know, unless they're using something that has the capacity to filter, like a NIOSH 95 or NIOSH 99 mask, um, those those radioactive fleas will continue to stay in the airplane and expose the passengers on right. that flight and on the next flight and on the next flight and so on. So, uh, and in fact, people can carry those radioactive fleas home with them. So this is a serious problem. Uh, he detected cesium-137 and strontium-90. Those are both of human health concern because they have half-lives of 30 years. Right. Strontium-90 is implicated in breast cancer. It, it goes to the bone and to uh, milk, and it's also implicated in uh, leukemia. The cesium-137, 30-year half-life, uh, is absorbed like the body, is absorbed by the body like potassium, but, uh, of course, the body can't use it like potassium, and so it ends up in the muscles. And So people that have heart problems might think that they had been exposed to cesium-137, right. which we all have after they did the above-ground testing in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Right. Now, I-31 has a, has a uh, very short half-life and uh, probably is not medically significant, except that you would be breathing in the air, and so it would be inside your body. Right. Anyway, what uh, Dr. Bill Deagle did after this trip, because uh, he felt that the counts per minute were high, he sent a letter to Senator Wyden, and uh, he says that, he, that he, you know, with all the <laughs> with all the medical credits that he that he has earned over the years, M D A A E M. A4M, ACAM, and uh, he says that this is urgent and that uh, the Fukushima radiation needs to be measured on all flights over the United States, including Alaska, and uh, that, they, that they report that they have action points uh, at 20,000 feet uh, over 2.5 microservant sievert per hour and, again, uh, more action point at 4.0 microsieverts per hour. So that what they want to do is, what he's suggesting is they collect air samples and uh, create a chain of custody uh, for radioisotopic analysis and radon type detection and for the duration of the flights. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so that if, if they could do that and if they could do it real time, then they could uh, map that into on the internet. They could map it into a, a database, and then they would know whether hazmat procedures right. uh, one for the passengers, but also for the rainfall or uh, dust uh, that uh, could be transmitted to the local FEMA police and public. So um, this is a very. I mean, he 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 thought that there was enough radiation on his trip that he measured that he has already contacted uh, Senator Wyden. Well, good for him. Uh, Dr. Bill has done the right thing there. We have a break here, and everybody stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. All right, we're back. 
back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. This is J.R. Moore and Ann Morrison substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle here on Genesis on the Nutra Medical Report on Friday, the 15th day of June. Uh, we do have more to talk about regarding the, this uh, Fukushima radiation thing. And, uh, Ann, you have, uh, it looks like about nine points here to go over regarding uh, mitigation of this problem. So let's just jump right in there. Steps to take to avoid exposure to fission products. Yes, uh, Dr. Bill is especially concerned because he, he's really worried about reactor number four. In Fukushima, the uh, fuel pool there contains both fuel rods and spent fuel rods, and the building is compromised. And so if that, if that uh, fuel pool should uh, end up on the ground, the water would probably drain out and the fuel rods would probably lay on top of each other and there could be an extremely uh, powerful atomic event. So these are uh, these are what I want uh, want uh, want our listeners to do, and some of them are are put in a way so that you'll remember them. And one, avoid dancing in the rain, and that's because the water vapor collects on the small dust of the radioactive particles. So the nucleus is radioactive. Wear personal protective equipment on your head and body. Minimize your time in the rainfall. Now you want to wear head protection in particular, such as goggles and the NIOSH. 95 medical mask until the rain washes. Now, what we have here in the Midwest is we have thunderstorms, and the tops of those thunderstorms go up to 50,000 feet. So when it rains, it, ra it washes the radioactive particles out of the air. But you, until that happens, you want to prevent radiation from ending, entering your eyes, your nose, and your mouth because radiation inside your body can do much more damage than the radiation outside Absolutely. your body. Absolutely. Yeah. So the second one is do not drink rainwater. Rainwater that is collected after a nuclear event should be disposed of in storm drain cisterns and shallow pits. Do not build your house at the bottom of the hill. Water runoff will contain radioactive contaminants. Direct water runoff to a cistern or a low spot or storm drain. Do not let it soak into your garden. Four, get a radiation detector. Radiation cannot be seen, heard, felt, tested tasted, or smelled. Five, take off outer garments prior to entering a home. Use outdoor shoes and indoor shoes. Do not let your child hug your leg prior to removing your outer clothing, dropping them into a plastic bag for washing, and rushing to a vigorous shower. Dispose of PPE properly. Disposable mash should be put into a container marked radioactive. Do not attempt to reuse disposable masks. Six, take a vigorous shower prior to hugging your loved ones. Work up a thick lather of soap prior to rinsing. Persons with long hair are more likely to catch radiation in their hairdo. Consider cutting hair. Seven, protect your garden spot with plastic. Place a plastic Quonset style cover over your garden spot so that rainwater will not, so that rainwater will run off to the sides. Dig a trench to collect the runoff away from your home and garden. Eight, avoid the dirty dozen foods. Now, these foods are known to collect pesticides inside them. And so no matter how much you wash them, you cannot get rid of the pesticides. Right, right. And, and they will likely collect radioactive particles. These foods are hard to clean. There are several government contracts being let out today to study the uptake of radiation from the soil. The following vegetables are known to take up bacteria from soil. Tomatoes, lettuce, spinach, and hot peppers. Hmm. Nine, keep your nose off the ground. <laughs> Avoid pre-range meat and eggs. Right. Strontium-90 and other radioactive particles are ingested when cows and chickens graze. Strontium-90 is, uh, is known to bioaccumulate in beef and milk and can be ingested by humans. The grass does not contain the radioactive particles. Grasses are not known to take up radiation. But the cows eat the radioactive particles when they eat the dirt along with the grass. That's good information, Anna, and it's a very important nine points there, and I hope people were able to get that. Are, are these posted at Dr. Bill's website? I believe he did. He uh, may. Uh, he wanted. He said he was going to update them, and he asked me to send them to him. Okay, great. Fantastic. He, he's, yeah, he wants us to do as much as we can to warn people that. There could be a large plume coming across the Pacific from Japan any time now. He doesn't know when, and right. uh, the people 
in the nuclear world don't know when. They just know that they have a very dangerous situation. Reactor number four at Fukushima is very hot, and that means radioactively hot. So they right. can't even get people close to it. Well, it is a dangerous situation, and it's not even close to being resolved and could get very, very bad. Um, now, I'm looking over uh, what he wrote here, his letter. Um, did he mention what kind of radiation detector he took with him? Inspector alert. There we go. Does he does he offer those for sale his website also, the inspector alert detectors? Yes. Okay, well, people ask me about that, and I get emails and questions about where can I get these devices. You go to, to uh, NutraMedical.com. Do not put the www in front of it. Just NutraMedical.com, and, and you'll find the inspector alert detectors on sale. And... Uh, Hopefully, it will just give you some peace of mind that you're not being radiated. If you are being radiated, you've got a decision to make whether to stay where you are or to escape the radiation, don't you, Anne? What they teach us in environmental engineering and in um, emergency management is time, distance, and shielding. So you have a short period of time after a nuclear event. Of course, we'll have three or four days before the radiation comes across the, the specific ocean in you know, we like to think that we live in a castle. You know, that nothing's. We don't right. think about things falling on our homes. But this radiation is different. Right. It's going to fall on your home. Your roof is going to become contaminated. Sometime you're going to have to get up there and and wash it off. Um, I lost my train of thought, John. Well, that's okay. That's okay. It's easy to lose your train of thought sometimes. Um, we do have the bottom of the hour coming up here soon. We'll have uh, Robert Felix coming on and, and talking about his cutting-edge uh, work that he's been doing about climate change, which you and I talk about a lot also. Uh, climate change uh, has already taken place and continues to take place. Uh, what's been broken is the, the five-year agricultural cycle that, uh, men and women involved in raising grains uh, depend on, which is in that five-year cycle, that there'll be four good harvests for, for every one bad harvest. Uh, they buy and lease land. They buy and lease equipment. They buy seed, fertilizer, and uh, pesticides and herbicides based on that being a reliable uh, fact of life, that every four seasons will be good for every one bad one. Uh, that cycle is broken, and Robert Felix will have, I'm sure, some fresh insights as to what's going on, why it's going on, and what we have to look forward to in the not-too-distant future regarding climate change. This is affecting everybody. You might be an urban dweller and, and uh, have never been in a cornfield or, or a planted a tomato, but uh, it affects all of us because the reduced harvest will translate into increased expense for all the food. Here's our bottom of the hour break. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is J.R. Moore and Ann Morrison substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle here on Genesis Network on Friday, the 15th day of June. And um, Dr. Bill's website is NutraMedical.com. My website, I have a, my own radio show on Republic Broadcasting Monday through Friday, 7 to 8 a.m. Central Time. Uh, my website is TheLibertyMan.com. There's a link on my links page to Ann Morrison's site. Her, her website is homeland-defense-4-letter-u.com. And we're discussing uh, the nuances of dealing with radiation coming from the Fukushima, Japan, uh, nuclear plant uh, disaster, I guess you could say. It appears to already be the worst um, nuclear accident uh, since these devices, these, mach these uh, uh, reactors have been in operation for about half a century or so. 
Uh, would that be an accurate statement, Anne, that this is the worst event since uh, we've had pr uh, civilian use of uh, radiation, uh, nuclear material? Yes, they finally admitted that it was the uh, worst event. Originally, they had thought that they would blame it on Chernobyl uh, as being the worst, but uh, right. they have since retracted that, and, and uh, when they come out with their estimates, uh, they always get higher. And, of course, this reactor number four is, is a very... A very <laughs> it's of concern. There is a, um, luckily we've been very lucky. The number of earthquakes has fallen dramatically since April um, um, 11th. Now, if you remember, on April 11th, uh, 2012, right. it was an 8.6 in northern Sumatra, an 8.2 in northern Sumatra and a 7.0 in the Gulf of Mexico. I think right. you remember the 7.0. Right. I think Dr. Bill felt it. But luckily, after that, the um, and in fact, we think that probably the 8.6 or the 8.2 near uh, Fukushima or in Indonesia may have contributed to the deterioration of the um, Reactor 4 building in right. Fukushima. But in any case, the number of earthquakes that have been occurring since that time has fallen off dramatically. And that, I mean the number, um, um, well, you call it a window, like the last seven days. Right. So you're, it's a sliding window. And what the USGS uh, keeps track of is they'll give you a total count for the past week, right. for the past right. seven days. And that's been falling. Uh, it's about half of what it was uh, since um, the the middle of April right. of this year, so starting in May it, it started out about 400, and today it's uh, 200. And, well, that's, I mean, a, that's a dramatic decrease. Yes. Well, yeah, May, uh, June, the middle of June. We're only talking a six week time period, right. and so the number of earthquakes. Now, these are the ones. These are events that are magnitude 2.5 and above. Okay. Um, so they don't count all the little ones. All right. So um, we are coming up to the uh, summer solstice. That will be when the day is the longest. And uh, usually we do expect earthquakes within a two-week window, and we are within the two-week two window. Is now, that, that system, two weeks total or two weeks before and two weeks after? Well, you know, I use two weeks before and two weeks after. Okay. But All in right. this case, I'm using it as one week before and one week after because okay. Because we've had this dramatic decrease in the number of earthquakes, and uh, so I'm thinking that something in the new <laughs> in the next two weeks, uh, there's going to be a massive earthquake someplace. I, you know, I just feel like this is not normal for right. for for there to be such a dramatic drop in earthquake in earthquake activity around the globe. Um, we are seeing earthquakes. Uh, 200 in the last seven days. In fact, we have one in California, and we have several in in um, Oklahoma. Right. But they're uh, of the minor kind, you know, less than four anyway. Okay. And uh, the San Andreas Fault remains active, and the uh, <clears throat> Popocatl Petal in Mexico, the uh, uh, that volcano. There's a lot of earthquakes associated right. with right. that, and and also on the uh, eastern side of the of the Caribbean and down on the northern part of South America. And, of course, there's a lot of earthquakes around Japan, and uh, some of the biggest ones have been out um, uh, between South America and Antarctica. And the further away the earthquake is from the equator, I use that as a, you know what a lever is. Right, you know, right. Archimedes said, give me a lever that's long enough and I can move the world. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and the same, I, I apply the same principle to earthquakes. If they're closer to the poles, then they're more likely to move the uh, spin axis or to have okay. an effect on the spin axis. Right, right. And, and so we've had uh, two, let me just pull it up here. This is a 5.1, and a, well, there were two 5.1s that were down between South America and Antarctica. Right. And uh, that's getting pretty close to the uh, Antarctic Circle. We still do have some over in Greece, too. They're watching a volcano that's just off the, uh, the uh, shoreline of Greece. Right. Um, when it 
uh, that volcano, when that volcano erupted um, about 2,000 years ago, 64 B.C., it, um, it created a tsunami 150 feet high, and it uh, wow. wiped out the population of Crete. I bet. So that's uh, so that that's of concern. People are seismologists are watching that one too, and of course Indonesia is is always active because it's a it's a it's a very complicated uh, plate that's cracking up, and so it's got a lot of fault lines in it. Okay. Uh, well, there's certainly a lot going on there, Anne. And uh, USGS is still posting earthquakes 5.0 and above in red, aren't they? You know they've changed their. Can you believe this? Do you believe that they would change their setup? You know, in this time of budget crises and everything else, you'd think that they'd let well enough alone. Uh-huh. But um, no, they didn't do that. And so the the map that you get now when you go to USGS is um, uh, it's. They don't. They don't seem to post them in red. They're, they're just all the same. They're all black. You know, the five point zero and large are all in black, also. Yes. In fact, there's a six one, six point zero, um, the off of Taiwan that was on the ninth, uh, and it's in black. And uh, five point eight in Turkey, that's in black. And a five point seven in Afghanistan. You know, it used to be. Uh, uh, that Those are all being red. Well, uh, it sounds like they're trying to cut back on on uh, the concern people have over these earthquakes. Well, they imp- you know, I say if it ain't broken, don't fix it. And I like their uh, previous web page because it, well, for one thing, it did post the the uh, larger magnitude earthquakes in mm-hmm. red, so it's easy to pick them out. Um, but they're gonna, they're they they have put warning. Messages on those sites and saying that they will not be using them. So we have to get used to this new uh, website. It does show you the earthquakes around the world, and it does give right. you a total. Right. Uh, you can change the uh, total that you see for uh, seven days, a magnitude greater than 2.5, or seven days all, or significant days, uh, significant earthquakes in a month, or... Um, all the earthquakes in them. So, you know, that yeah, and you and I have both seen the United States Geological Survey uh, reduce the severity of earthquakes and magnitude and, elim- and, re- and just eliminate earthquakes altogether uh, from their reporting. Well, yeah, usually there's a reason for that. And the reason is that sometimes what happens is they have machines now that read the, the raw right. data. Yeah, especially at night, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, that cuts down on manpower and it makes their work easier. And so the machines uh, often interpret it, interpret data as earthquakes when it's a slide wow. or a uh, rock fall or a blasting. And you can see this if you go to the uh, Oklahoma um, earthquake website, University of Oklahoma, it, it, it actually annotates. We have a break coming up. Hold it. This is J.R. Moore and Ann Morrison, substituting for Dr. Bill Deagle here on the Nutramedical Report on Friday, June 15th, 2012. Uh, Dr. Bill's website is nutramedical.com. That's nutramedical.com. My website is thelibertyman.com, and Ann Morrison's is uh, homeland-defense number four, letter U.com, which is linked on my links page. And uh, we're going to discuss here these last few minutes, this last quarter hour of the show, uh, solar flares, and we had a solar flare event uh, yesterday, June fourteenth. Tell us about that, Ann. Yeah, that was a uh, that was an M class flare. Now you remember that uh, flares are measured on a logarithmic scale, and so you go from one into uh, to ten, and uh, the first level is a C class, and then there's an M class, and uh, then there's two X classes that are. Uh, the X classes go from one and to uh, hundred. Right. So we had an M class flare, and uh, this was from uh, Sunspot uh, AR one five zero four. Right. 
and it hurled a CME. Now, the flare alone, when it hits, and it will hit before the uh, CME will, right. um, but the flare will uh, ionize the air, at the atmosphere, and and it will, uh, so, it, so we should be seeing uh, auroras and... Um, Essentially, what it does is it charges up the the atmosphere. The right. storms may be big, stronger than than forecast for one thing. Now, the CME when it hits, it's due to hit at uh, five o'clock in the morning tomorrow here in uh, right. in the Midwest. And um, what the CMEs do is that uh, they are they are magnetic lines of force. They are a cloud of a very complicated magnetic field, and not an electromagnetic field, but an ele- just a magnetic field. So it interacts with our magnetic field. And what it does when it hits the Earth is that it pushes our magnetosphere uh, towards the Earth where it hits, and then on right. the other side of the Earth, it pushes our magnetosphere away from the Earth. Now, the magnetosphere, because it's magnetic, uh, we'll take some of the electrons from the atmosphere with it, and uh, there's a pullback then effect of those electrons, and those electrons celebra- <laughs> accelerate uh, when they, when they return to the Earth. So on the opposite side, on the dark side of the Earth, from the CME, what you'll see is you'll see uh, electron disturbances, and these can be just as powerful as the magnetosphere disturbances on the right. sunlit side of right. the Earth. Now, what the CME does, it does two things. One, it's a magnetic field. When a magnetic field, that is our magnetosphere, uh, passes through a conductor, for instance, long transmission lines, the, um, it induces a current. And so uh, what happens is that that current may be uh, going with the current that the power companies are putting out or may go against it. So you're likely to... Uh, experience brownouts or spikes in your electricity. And those spikes can be powerful enough to burn out your electronic items, such as right. television right. and, and uh, other electronic items that you have in your house. The other thing it does is it creates ground currents. Now, ground currents are the reason that we ground our electrical equipment and why our plumbing is grounded. Because if you have a ground current and it comes upon something that is not connected to the ground, then that ground current will come up into your building. And right. we've had some trouble with, uh, with power plants, both nuclear power plants and, and coal-fired power plants. And what will happen is that the transformers will burn out. Now, I think you remember that in Ottawa, Canada, that happened, oh, golly, it must be 15 or 20 years ago, and caused the big blackout that went down into New York State. And uh, the Canadians figured out, well, it's because, the, because of the long length of their transmission line, that's why, they had, that's why their transformers got knocked out. So they went in and they put isolators every 100 miles. Right. And uh, the United States, uh, you know, they, they considered it. And then the uh, people that are in charge of power lines said, no, we're not going to do that. So the United States is more vulnerable uh, to CMEs, at least as far as their electrical grid goes. And a strong CME can, or a, or a CME that hits at exactly the right spot on Earth, can take down the public power lines, right. can take down the grid, as they say. So if you're not prepared to live off the grid, and in some cases, I've heard you say, John, that when uh, some of these transformers go out, uh, the lead time on replacing them is months. Well, it, right now, under normal conditions, it takes three years to order and take delivery of one big transformer. They're not made in the United States. They only manufacture 100 a year, and there's literally thousands of these at risk. Um, I, I need to, in fact, um, tomorrow's morning's mail in. I'm going to mail you some of the new Faraday bags that I, ca- I carry for sale at my website. Uh, these are specially engineered bags that have a very thin 
uh, aluminum sheet in them with uh, protective sheets on either side of, of plastic that will protect electronic devices, radios, telephones, laptops, and so forth uh, from uh, the effects of, of uh, solar radiation and electromagnetic pulse from bombs as well. So uh, you'll, you'll, I'll look about tomorrow morning, and uh, you should have them uh, Tuesday or Wednesday uh, to help you protect your equipment. Well, I'll certainly do that. In fact, I may even carry my <clears throat> my cell phone inside a bag. <laughs> As I that wouldn't be a bad idea. I'll send you a selection of cell phone size, iPad size, and laptop size. I'll send you several of each, and then you can use them uh, to take care of your equipment. That would be great, John, and I appreciate your offer. The um, um, If the power grid goes down, then you need to be able to live off-grid. Now, unfortunately, if you don't have good grounding at your house, now most building codes insist that you have at least your water pipes, your cold water pipe, grounded. Right. But if you have additional antennas, for instance, if you're a ham radio operator like you and I are, John, then you also need a ground for your radios because if you don't have that, these ground currents will actually back up into your house and burn out your your radio equipment. So right. I... And it doesn't take much for that to happen. I mean, I was told that even the uh, cord that goes to the microphone on a ham radio will right. create enough current to burn out the, the radio. So you want to detach your microphones. You, uh, I like to put my radios and my electronics on a UPS. A UPS is an uninterruptible power supply. Right. Right. And uh, if you have one that's online then that means that it has a battery inside of it that it keeps charged, and you will be able to continue to operate for oh, maybe an hour or two hours, depending right. on how big a UPS that you have. Right. If you don't have a UPS or if you have just a regular UPS, then as soon as the power spike comes through, it will shut down. Now, it will protect your equipment, but then you won't have any power unless you have That's a generator. Right. And... Uh, and uh, some way of capturing the power from the generator, like a battery. You need a, an inverter. No, you need a converter and then an inverter and, and probably a bank of batteries right. to uh, get you through uh, the time. Now, John is talking three years. Right. I mean, I, that is an astonishing length of time for public power to be down. Actually, it would be a lot longer than that. They only make 100 a year to replace ones that have been uh, you know, used up in, in normal usage. So we're actually looking at a lot longer period of time, uh, possibly decades. John, <laughs> um, we're, you know, I've got a generator, and you've got a generator, and you've got, a ba you've got batteries. I don't have batteries right. yet. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm prepared to run my generator, whatever it takes. Now, people are going to need um, ways to, medic to uh, refrigerate their medicine. And in the summer, you're going to need a way to stay cool. Now, what I did was that I bought a portable air conditioner. It only heats 200 square feet. It only cools 200 square feet. Right. But it can be run off a generator, whereas a whole house air conditioner probably will not be able to be run off a generator. Now, these generators, these backup generators that you get on the market, and they come out and install them, you have to understand that they're not, they're just backup generators. They are not um, generators that are going to last any length of time. They will probably run for about 300 hours. Right, right. And we got a, that, we got music coming up here. I think we're done, Ann. Thank you for your time. Dr. Bill should be back in his chair behind the microphone next week. Uh, you all have a great weekend out there. Be safe, and uh, we'll uh, be back next week.